Welcome to Dermatology Explained. Today's video presentation is focusing on a condition known as sarcoidosis, which has both cutaneous as well as extracutaneous presentations. Sarcoidosis is a multi-system disorder characterized by the presence of non-caseating granulomas on histology. It is also known as Dr. Boeck's disease or Mortimer's malady. Sarcoidosis is presently considered a great dermatologic masquerader as it can mimic a variety of different presentations and we'll be overviewing some of these clinical presentations in this video. The most commonly affected organ is the lung. However, the skin, eyes and lymph nodes are frequently involved. It can present in the acute phase, subacute phase or can be self-limiting. And sarcoidosis often waxes and wanes over years. The earliest description of sarcoid was given by Besnia in 1889, and it was described as lupus pernio. Tennyson then gave the first histopathological description in 1892. Boeck introduced the term sarcoid in 1899, as well as the concept that this disease involves both the skin and internal organs. In Greek, sarco means flesh, and iodos means like and osis means condition, therefore sarcoidosis means a flesh-like condition. The epidemiology of sarcoid comprises two peaks in terms of the age groups, from 25 to 40 years of age and 50 to 60 years of age. It is more common in African Americans as well as some risk groups, including healthcare workers. There is a greater prevalence in females, and Scandinavia has the world's highest prevalence. There are a number of unknown etiology and triggers for sarcoidosis, but it is thought to comprise some of the following. Firstly, is a genetic susceptibility or familial risk for sarcoidosis. This includes having <clears throat> genetic makeup, including HLA1, HLAB8, DR3, DRB1, and DQB1. There's also thought to be an infective etiology, including mycoplasma, propionibacterium, Rickettsia, Borrelia, Mycobacteria, and viruses such as HHV8 and EBV. Environmental triggers including inorganic dusts and particles such as aluminium, zinc, talc, and beryllium, as well as an organic source such as a pine tree pollen. There's thought to be an association with malignancy including Hodgkin's lymphoma. Autoimmune associations including Sjogren's, systemic sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, for example, as well as drug medications. And this can include interferons, often used to treat hepatitis C, immune checkpoint inhibitors such as ipilimumab and nivolumab, targeted kinase inhibitors such as bemorafenib, TNF-alpha inhibitors, as well as vaccine medications. In terms of the pathogenesis of sarcoidosis, it is a Th1 predominant immune response, and there are three major events. First event is exposure to the antigen, which is currently unknown, but may include some of the triggers listed in the previous slides. The second event is the presentation of these processed antigens on antigen presenting cells, including macrophages. And the third event is activated macrophages producing an interleukin 12, which induces the lymphocytes to shift towards a Th helper one profile. This causes a subsequent release of IL-2, IL-12, IL-18 interferon gamma, as well as tumor necrosis factor, TNF-alpha, by macrophages and some CD8 positive T cells. This results in a persistent Th1 activity, as well as persistent interferon gamma elevation, and this further recruits more monocytes and macrophages and turns them into giant cells, essentially. In terms of the clinical features of sarcoidosis, cutaneous sarcoidosis, we can split them up into two major groups, specific features as well as non-specific features. This is a table that lists the frequent, less frequent, and specific locations of specific presentations of sarcoidosis. Under the frequent group, it is often seen papular, maculopapular, plaque, annular, lupus pernio, subcutaneous nodular form, as well as sarcoidosis in scar and tattoo sites. In the lesser frequent form of sarcoidosis, this may include presentations such as angiolupoid, hypopigmented, 
glycanoid, ulcerative, atrophic, psoriasiform, verrucous, necrobiasis lipoidica like, ichthyosiform, erythrodermic, morpheiform, polymorphous, photodistributed, and tumoral. And in under specific location types, this includes oral cavity, scalp, nail, and genital. In the subsequent slides, we'll go through some of these clinical presentations. The first form to discuss is papular sarcoidosis. This often presents on the face, especially around the eyelids and nasolabial folds. There are numerous non-scaly skin-colored yellow-brown to red-brown violations or hyperpigmented papules, which are size one to 10 millimeters. It usually resolves without scarring. An example is shown in the image on the right-hand side. There's a form called papular sarcoid of the knees, which was recently described. It involves papules in a linear array and is considered to be a transitional form between papular and scar sarcoidosis. It is also associated with erythema nodosum. It has a good prognosis. The next type is macular papular sarcoid. It most commonly involves the neck area, trunk, extremities, and mucous membranes. It is commonly associated with acute organ involvement. It may be sometimes transient and appear the herald onset of disease. Maculopapular sarcoid generally has a good prognosis. In most cases, the systemic disease is inactive within two years. Plaque sarcoidosis has a similar frequency to papular sarcoidosis. It more commonly develops on the back, buttocks, face, and extensive surfaces of the extremities. It consists of one or multiple round or oval infiltrated patches and plaques with a brownish red in color and may have confluence of papules. It tends to be larger than five millimeters in diameter, is usually thicker and more indurated than the papular form of sarcoid. In the annular form of sarcoid, we see circinate or annular papules or plaques, which predominate on the forehead, face, and neck areas. The central area may become depigmented or scarred. Ulceration is rare. Lupus pernio is an important form of sarcoidosis to know because it is a hallmark of chronic fibrotic disease and is associated with scarring disfigurement. It is more commonly seen in black females and West Indians with long-standing sarcoidosis. There is a chronic violation to telangiectatic indurated plaques and lesions predominantly on the nose and cheek areas. The lesions enlarge to become confluent to form progressively disfiguring nodular plaques on the nose and adjacent cheeks, as seen here on the right-hand side. It can also involve the upper respiratory tract, cause nasal ulceration, obstruction, and perforation of the nasal septum. Lupus pernia usually follows a very chronic course. It is frequently associated with systemic involvement. This can lead to mutilating sarcoidosis. Severe form of lupus pernio involves large centrifacial tumors and plaques extending into oral and upper respiratory tissue. Here are some images demonstrating lupus pernio, the nodular type on the left hand side, as well as mutilating lesions with extension into the, into the nasal mucosa on the right hand side. There is a form of sarcoidosis called Perth's jungling disease. This involves lytic and cystic bone lesions in the hands and feet, which underlie the lesions of lupus pernio. When the terminal phalanx is affected, the nail may be dystrophic. There's also a phenomenon called drumstick dactylitis, a severe form with bulbous swelling of the fingertips. The next form of sarcoidosis is the subcutaneous form, also known as Daria Rassi form of sarcoidosis. These appear as non-tender, firm mobile subcutaneous nodules 0.5 to 2 centimeters in diameter. They may range from 1 to 100 in number, sometimes appearing in clusters and arise deep in the dermis and subcutaneous tissue of the extremities and trunk. They're more commonly found on the forearms where they tend to coalesce to form linear bands. It is often associated with stage one changes on chest x-ray, along with other non-severe systemic findings of this disease. In the scar form of sarcoid, 
This is characterized by infiltration of non-caseating sarcoidogranulomas in surgical scars, tattoos, skin piercings, and other sites of trauma. It is difficult to clinically distinguish from a granulomatous foreign body reaction in a scar. It tends to persist according to the activity of the systemic sarcoidosis and usually resolves slowly and spontaneously. Angioleupoid sarcoid is a variant of plaque sarcoidosis and is characterized by the presence of prominent large telangiectasias. The lesions are orange red or reddish brown in color and have a more livid hue compared to other forms. It usually presents as a single raised plaque on the bridge of the nose, central face, ears, or scalp. There is little tendency to spontaneous resolution in angiolupoid form of sarcoid. It is often mistaken for rosacea. In hyperpigmented form of sarcoid, it affects almost exclusively dark skinned people of African descent. The lesions manifest as hyperpigmented, well demarcated, round to oval patches located mainly on the extremities. It may have a fried egg appearance, that is, erythematous papules can be found in the center of some lesions, leading to an appearance resembling a fried egg. In the lichenoid form of sarcoid, this comprises multiple 1 to 3 millimeters erythematous or violaceous, slightly scaling macular papules involving an extensive area of the skin. They occur singly or in groups, especially localized on the trunk, limbs, and face. Wickham's striae is typically absent. Lichenoid lesions have particularly been reported in younger children and have a specific triad of skin, joint, and eye disease. Pulmonary disease is not usually found in lichenoid sarcoidosis. In ulcerative sarcoid, these generally develop in papulonodular lesions. Some may appear de novo. The ulcer can develop in psoriasiform, atrophic, lymphedematous, erythrodermic, and verrucous lesions. They are located primarily on the lower legs and tend to heal with scarring. Trauma can be an exciting factor in other sarcoidosis lesions. In psoriasiform sarcoid, these cases present with well demarcated, erythematous, scaly plaques that may be clinically indistinguishable from psoriasis. They often involve the extensive surfaces of extremities, face, scalp, back, and buttock areas. In Veruca sarcoid, this is most commonly seen on the face or areas such as the groin and axilla, where there is constant friction. It comprises well-demarcated, exophytic hyperkeratotic plaques or discrete papillomatous skin-colored papules. In ichthyosiform sarcoidosis, these cases present with adherent, irregular, polyclonal, dry, gray, or brown scales, varying in size from 0.1 cm to 1 cm. They are most commonly located on the lower extremities. Biopsy would demonstrate typical sarcoidal granulomatous inflammation with changes of ichthyosis vulgaris. In erythrodermic sarcoid, there is the presence of large areas of skin with significant erythema, induration, and scaling. This typically begins with slightly infiltrated, erythematous to yellow-brown plaques that subsequently coalesce over large areas. Skip areas can also be seen. In oral cavity sarcoid, this usually comprises of diffuse enlargement at the submucosal level or firm nodular lesion with normal overlying mucosa. Papules, superficial ulcerations, and strawberry gums have also been described. It is usually symptomless. Most commonly seen on the buccal mucosa, followed by the gum, lips, floor of mouth, tongue, and palate. Scalp form of sarcoid is usually a scarring type of alopecia. Scale is usually absent, although follicular plugging may be seen. In the late stage, it may be dis indistinguishable from pseudopelade of Brock. In neosarcoidosis, this often presents a subungual hyperkeratosis, clubbing, pitting, tracheonychia, paronychia with neophol fissuring, pterygium, onycholysis, dactylitis, longitudinal ridging, and discoloration of the nail bed. Nail involvement is usually a marker of more chronic disease, and it is often accompanied by phalangeal bone disease, which is frequently associated with intrathoracic sarcoidosis. Now we move on to some nonspecific skin findings in sarcoidosis, and the first one is erythema nodosum. This presents as symmetric, tender erythematous nodules and raised plaques, typically on the lower anterior legs. 
most common nonspecific lesion and develops in up to 25% of sarcoidosis cases. It has good prognostic significance usually, which means it has a self-resolving nature. There is a syndrome involving sarcoidosis called Lofgren syndrome. It comprises of bilateral hyla lymph adenopathy, acute polyarthritis with fevers, as well as erythema nodosum in the setting of sarcoidosis. Lofgren syndrome usually has a good prognosis and over 80% of cases resolve spontaneously within two years. In terms of genetic predisposition, HLA-DRB1 alleles affect disease prognosis in Lofgren syndrome. There is another syndrome known as Herford's syndrome. This comprises uveo parotid fever, including parotid gland enlargement, uveitis, fever, and facial nerve palsy on the same side. Other nonspecific skin findings include calcineurosis cutis, erythematous rash resembling a viral exanthem or drug eruption, pruritus or parago nodularis, erythema multiforme like lesions, lower limb swelling. There is also a form of sarcoidosis that appears in childhood. Sarcoidosis overall is uncommon in children. It can affect both sexes equally. There is an early onset form that presents in less than five years, as well as a late onset form that presents in children older than five years. The classic presentation of childhood sarcoidosis includes a triad of arthritis, erythema nodosum, and uveitis in the less than five year age group. Older children usually present with a multi-system disease similar to adult manifestations with frequent hyla lymph adenopathy and pulmonary infiltrates. Most frequent cutaneous eruptions include soft red to yellow, brown or violaceous flat topped papules found most frequently on the face. If there are no skin lesions, then lymph nodes are the next best site for biopsy. This is a table which separates the different presentations of sarcoidosis according to the prognostic factor. So forms of sarcoidosis with good prognosis includes papular for macular papular, subcutaneous, childhood, erythema nodosum, Lofgren syndrome, and lichenoid. The ones with poor prognosis includes plaque form, lupus pernio, angiolupid, ichthyosiform, verrucous, hyperpigmented, um, as well as ulcerative sarcoidosis. So nail sarcoidosis, scalp sarcoidosis, and ulcerative sarcoidosis. Next, we go on into the systemic features associated with sarcoidosis. Pulmonary manifestations occur in 90% of patients with sarcoid. It involves bilateral hyla lymph adenopathy. The granulomas involve interstitial areas, including the bronchioles, bronchioles, alveoli, and blood vessels. It can result in primary alveolitis, irreversible fibrosis, pleural effusions, and these cases present with dyspnea, coughing, and really hemoptysis. The table on the right-hand side demonstrates the different radiographic stages of pulmonary sarcoidosis. Stage zero involves minimal changes to the x-rays. Stage one involves predominantly bilateral hyalolymph adenopathy, but no parenchymal infiltrates. In stage two, there's both bilateral hyalolymph adenopathy as well as parenchymal infiltrates. In stage three, there is predominantly parenchymal infiltrates, and in stage four is a mixed picture with both presenting in a variable state. Here are some images demonstrating stage one and stage two lung changes with sarcoidosis. We can see here with stage one, there's the bilateral hyaluronic adenopathy, and in stage two, there is the um, parenchymal infiltrates with the bilateral hyaluronic adenopathy. And in stage three, it's predominantly the parenchymal changes that we can see on X-ray imaging. And with stage four, it's quite a severe mixed picture. This is a CT scan demonstrating miliary sarcoidosis, which demonstrates well-defined lung nodules less than five millimeters in diameter. This pattern is quite rare. This is another image demonstrating alveolar sarcoidosis, multiple lung masses, are uh, seen in an unusual form of sarcoidosis, which may mimic or resemble lung metastases. Next, we have upper respiratory tract findings in sarcoidosis, and this can pre present in lupus pernio. There is granulomatous invasion of the nasal and oral mucosa, larynx, pharynx, and salivary glands, as well as the tonsil and tongue. 
enlargement of the parotid gland can occur in 6% of patients. And they present with nasal congestion, palatal obstruction, and disfigurement. Ocular sarcoidosis is also very important to consider and, and, and assess for. They present with gritty sensation of the eye, conjunctival sicca, acute anterior uveitis, iris nodules, scleral plaques, lacrimal gland enlargement, and chorioretinitis. And some of these are demonstrated here on the right-hand side. Musculoskeletal presentation of sarcoidosis includes weakness, pain, tenderness, and erythema. Bone cysts and osteolytic lesions may form. There's chronic myopathy, muscle nodules, arthralgias, arthritis, fever, and weight loss, and tinnitus sinovitis. Here are some radiographs. On the left-hand side, we see punched-out lytic lesions on the distal phalanxes with focal osteolytic lesions in the fingers, which is the most common abnormality. On the right-hand side, we see a lacy trabecular pattern where osteolysis has left this pattern in the phalanx, as you can see where the arrow is demonstrating. Here are some further radiographic images. On the left-hand side, we see quite significant advanced sarcoidosis with osteolytic lesions of the distal forearm, wrists, and bones of the hand. On the right-hand side, there's nasal bone lesion involvement by nasal sarcoidosis, which leads to osteolysis of the nasal bone. Sarcoid can also involve the liver. 33% have hepatomegaly or biochemical evidence of liver involvement. Symptoms are usually absent. They can present with cholestasis, fibrosis, cirrhosis, portal hypertension, and Bud Chiari syndrome. Cardiac involvement occurs in 25% of cases. It can affect any part of the heart. These cases are mostly asymptomatic. Screening should be performed to rule out cardiac involvement of sarcoidosis. This includes arrhythmias, heart blocks, heart failure, pericarditis, and effusions, as well as myocardial infarction and sudden cardiac death. Cardiac sarcoidosis is very difficult to diagnose. Screening and diagnosis can be done by ECG, auto monitoring, echocardiography, nuclear imaging with thallium or technetium cestamibi, cardiac PET or MRI imaging, heart biopsy is rarely considered. Neurological sarcoidosis affects 15% of cases. Some people with neurosarcoidosis may recover completely. In others, sarcoidosis and related central nervous system or nervous system symptoms are chronic and last a long time and even a lifetime sometimes. CNS symptoms are not usually the first or only sign of sarcoidosis, so it's important to look for the other systemic and cutaneous features of sarcoidosis in these cases. Rarely, neurosarcoidosis is the only sign of sarcoidosis in which case is often very difficult to diagnose. CT, MRI, PET scan imaging, and lumbar puncture will aid in diagnosis, and biopsy is very rarely done. They can present with nerve inflammation and damage, peripheral neuropathy, and histologically, granulomas are present in the meninges, which can lead to meningitis, hydrocephalus, and neuroendocrine disorders. Cranial nerves and peripheral nerves can also be involved. The most common uh, cranial nerve that's involved in the seventh nerve facial palsy, which results in acute, transient, and can be unilaterally or bilaterally. As alluded to earlier, Herfert syndrome involves facial palsy accompanied by fever, uveitis, and enlargement of the parotid gland. There's optic nerve dysfunction, which can result in blurring, double vision, and blindness. Seizures, paresthesias, and encephalopathy are also associated features in some cases. Here's an MR image demonstrating temporal lobe sarcoid. Sarcoidosis can also affect the kidneys. There's increased calcium absorption in the gut. And this is as a result of the high levels of circulating 1,25-dihydroxy vitamin D produced by the mononuclear phagocytes in the granulomas in sarcoid. And this results in hypercalcemia, hypercalciuria, and in some cases may be associated with renal stones causing nephrocalcinosis and renal impairment. Lymphadenopathy, as already alluded to, is one of the key features in sarcoidosis. Aside from the hyaluronic lymphadenopathy, intrathoracic nodes may be enlarged in 75 to 90% of cases. And there may also be peripheral lymphadenopathy. Other systemic features include gastrointestinal involvement. Um, there are some images here demonstrating gastric sarcoid with granuloma involving the gastric antrum, leading to irregular, non specific narrowing on the left hand side. 
on the right hand side is an image demonstrating colonic sarcoid with irregular narrowing of the recto sigmoid, which has an appearance of inflammatory disease or malignancy. It can affect the liver with hepatic granulomas present in 50 to 65% of liver biopsies. Elevation of LFT is only detected in up to 35% of cases. Treatment is only necessary in symptomatic cases. The lab abnormalities associated with sarcoidosis includes a lymphocytopenia, a mild eosinophilia, increased inflammatory markers such as ESR, hypoglobulinemia, as well as elevated ACE levels. The reason for this is activated macrophages produce ACE. It's non-specific. It's also elevated in a number of other conditions, including Hodgkin's, histoplasma, and leprosy. ACE levels may be checked to determine the course of resolution and response to therapy rather than as a diagnostic tool. So histological mimics of sarcoidosis includes foreign body reactions such as to fillers, tattoo ink, silica, granulomatous form of mycosis fungoides, granulomatous rosacea, orofacial granulomatosis, Crohn's disease, Blau syndrome, infections including tuberculosis and atypical mycobacteria. In terms of the diagnostic approach, it's difficult to differentiate sarcoidosis from chronic infections, fungal disease, and TB and lymphoma. And so it is important to combine our clinical, radiologic, and histological findings to come up with a diagnosis. Laboratory testing is seldom important. Identify non caseating granulomas, which are indicative of sarcoidosis. Transbronchial biopsies may be positive in 65 to 95% of cases, even though no lung parenchymal abnormalities may be imaged. Tissue from mediastinoscopy is positive in 95% of cases. In terms of histology of sarcoidosis, a 4 millimeter punch biopsy for H&E and fresh biopsy for culture and PCR for mycobacteria bacteria and fungal infection is important. It's important to remember that sarcoidosis is a diagnosis of exclusion, so it's important to send off for cultures and exclude an underlying infection. In terms of the histological features, non caseating naked granulomas with minimal inflammation. There may be Langerhans, Langens multinucleated histiocytes. There are astrobodies, which are trapped collagen bundles, which appear eosinophilic on histology. There's also Schorman bodies, which are calcium oxalate impregnated protein complexes within multinucleated giant cells. 20 to 50% have polarizable material may have foreign body granuloma too. So this does not necessarily exclude sarcoidosis. It's important to do stains such as zeal nielsen and fight, as well as culture and PCR to exclude other infections which may present in a similar way. Here are some histological images which demonstrate those naked granulomas. On the left-hand side, we have the asteroid bodies, which have a star shape. On the right-hand side, we have Schorman bodies. This is a table summarizing some of the differing features between sarcoidosis and tuberculosis. In terms of investigations, um, this would include a full blood count looking for any lymphopenia, leukopenia, eosinophilia, anemia, and blood film. Inflammatory markers such as ESR, electrolytes, urea and creatinine, as well as urine and calcium, looking for any evidence of nephrocalcinosis. Liver function testing to determine whether there's any liver involvement. Calcium, magnesium, phosphate electrolyte levels to determine if there's any hypercalcemia from the granulomas. ACE positive in 66% of cases. It's good for monitoring response to diseases rather than as a diagnostic tool. Vitamin D level, thyroid function testing, quantifying gold to exclude a tuberculosis infection, as well as a full immunosuppression screen as pre-treatment lab workup. It's also important to consider malignancy screening such as for myeloma and lymphoma by looking at IEPG, EPG, and LDH. This is a table which demonstrates some other conditions associated with ACE levels. As you can see, an elevated ACE is not necessarily specific or diagnostic of sarcoidosis as a number of other conditions can present with elevated ACE levels. So it's important to keep that in mind. Other investigations include imaging of the chest such as chest X-ray or high resolution CT. As alluded to earlier, there's multiple stages which range from stage zero to stage four with quite significant pulmonary fibrosis, bronchovascular beating. Diffusion limited um, CO studies as a spirometry to look for restrictive lung pattern associated with sarcoidosis. 
bronchial alveolar lavage can be used as an adjunct for diagnosis. Further imaging, including CT scan and PET scanning to determine the ex extent of the disease. Imaging of the heart, as well as testing of the heart, including ECG and echocardiogram, abdominal ultrasound and fibro scan, nerve conduction studies, MRI, ophthalmology review, specifically looking for eye involvement such as uveitis, as well as potentially considering sinus pain film and ENT nasal endoscopy to exclude nasal involvement of sarcoidosis. In terms of management, it really requires a multidisciplinary approach given the systemic involvement of sarcoidosis. Often this will include the respiratory team, ophthalmology team, gastroenterology, neurology, endocrine, renal, and rheumatology. Treatment is indicated for patients where the disease is cosmetically disfiguring, symptomatic, ulcerating, or progressively worsening. Lupus pernia almost always needs treatment given that it's chronic and it is involving significant scarring. Treatment principles and approach includes prednisone, hydroxychloroquine, and methotrexate as most commonly used immunosuppression. Doxycycline and minocycline have weak data, but is also used due to their relative safety profile. And for refractory disease, the lidomide and infliximab is often considered. So topical treatment options include diprazone OV, under occlusion, tacrolimus ointment on the face and intertrigenous areas and intralesional corticosteroid injections. Physical options include phototherapy, narrowband, but UVB phototherapy, as well as UVA phototherapy, photodynamic therapy, and CO2 laser ablation for any cutaneous lesions, as well as cryotherapy. Systemic options are, include doxycycline, minocycline for antibiotics, as well as systemic options for stage two and three pulmonary disease and hypercalcemia, neurological or cardiac input involvement. And this includes prednisolone, as well as steroid sparing agents, such as hydroxychloroquine, methotrexate, mycophenolate, and JAK inhibitors have also been described, including tofacitinib more recently. TNF-alpha medications, such as adalimumab, um, theoretically should work very well as they will break down the granulomas. Other options include dapsone, sarcosporin, azathioprine, retinoids, azotretinoin, thalidomide, allopurinol, pentoxifilin, apremolast, cyclophosphamide, and experimental antimicrobacterial treatments as well. As you can see, there's a wide range of medications that have been tried for sarcoidosis, and it is a very challenging condition to treat. In terms of disease monitoring, for active disease, um, blood monitoring and lung function testing should be performed every three to four months. And uh, every 12 months should consider, in addition to routine bloods, vitamin D, ACE levels, ECG, and ophthalmological exam, as well as chest X-ray. Once the disease has been controlled and is more inactive, then monitoring should be performed every 12 to 18 months. Further investigations can be performed as indicated, depending on symptoms, including high resolution CT, echo, halter monitoring, urinalysis, thyroid function testing, and MRI for neurological symptoms. In terms of prognosis, the mortality rate ranges from 1% to 5%, which is predominantly from respiratory complications. Granulomas resolve in 60% of patients within five years, but they can progress to fibrosis. 80% of papular sarcoidosis completely resolves within two years. 10% of plaque sarcoidosis resolves within two years. Therefore, it is associated with more disease of chronicity compared to papular sarcoidosis. The ones with poor prognosis includes plaque uh, sarcoidosis, lupus, pernia, nail, diarrhea, RUSI, and those with systemic involvement. The ones with good prognosis includes papular sarcoid and Lofgren syndrome. Thank you so much for listening to our presentation today on sarcoidosis. We hope you've learned something and taken something away from this very challenging condition, and we hope to see you next time in the next video.